the good news, and I want to give you one piece of good news before I go into this slide that I want you to remember through the rest of this talk. Listen to this really carefully. 60 to 70 percent of the GNP of the entire country of the Netherlands is produced below sea level. 60 percent of the population in the Netherlands lives below sea level and has done so for about 800 years. So just sort of keep that in mind, okay? <laughs> as, as a hopeful uh, piece. Bob Rich was my predecessor here at the aquarium, and it's thanks to him that the aquarium is looking so wonderful these days. And um, I wanted him to stay on with me, but he <laughs> said no. Um, so he is now a senior advisor on climate change in the Bar Foundation here in Boston. And he is really going to update um, for us some of the um, predictions of impacts of climate change on the waterfront over the next several decades. I've actually been working on this topic uh, quite a long time. I wrote my master's thesis in 1975 in graduate school on how to manage development on barrier islands in the face of the dynamics of the oceans and shifting sands and seas. So uh, I've worked on this topic for a very long time. My first or second job was uh, working for the Coastal Zone Management Program in the Commonwealth here of Massachusetts. Uh, and I authored all of the sections of that plan that dealt with coastal hazards and risk. So I've kind of come back full circle. Um, somebody introduced me a few weeks ago as having worked on climate change so long that the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere increased 90 during my time frame. It went from uh, 310 parts per million to 400 parts per million. So that's a very long time period. But um, I've been involved in, in the last several years, starting when I was uh, in Nigella's job here at the Aquarium on the Green Ribbon Commission in Boston. <clears throat> and this is a really interesting group. It's rather unique in cities in the United States. It's about 30 or 35 CEOs from the private sector, many of them in the development world and the real estate world here in Boston, many of them big property owners in the city. It also includes the heads of some of the major hospitals, for example, Mass General and Partners Healthcare. Uh, the presidents of BU, senior executives from Harvard and MIT, um, and a couple of nonprofit uh, representatives, um, all of whom are working in partnership with the city to make our city greener. Um, so there's a, there's a twin focus. One is on mitigating emissions of carbon, primarily looking at the building and property sector here in Boston, and more recently, trying to figure out what the topic, which the topic of my talk tonight is on how do we protect our city in the faces of the great changes coming ahead from climate change. So you can read the blurb up there, but the longer the short of it is, how do we save Boston so we don't have to move to Springfield? <laughs> <coughs> and you'll see why in just a few minutes. Um, a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, Boston is approaching its 400th anniversary in 2030. This is a map from 1775, and I want you to imprint this on your brain because we're gonna come back to it a little bit later, but I'll, 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 I'll show you a snapshot of it later. But we were built on a hill, I think as everybody knows, uh, Beacon Hill. Um, we're here partly because it was a very deep harbor, partly because it was the closest uh, US port to Europe, but also very much because it was well protected uh, from the arm and the elbow of Cape Cod and also from 34 harbor islands. Uh, that are now a national park uh, off our shores. Over time, it was filled quite dramatically. You, uh, you can 1630, 1880, and then from uh, to the present. Um, so you'll recognize the Back Bay uh, and South Boston down here, Back Bay up here, and you know the harbor is a lot narrower than it was 400 years ago. Um, and then, of course, today uh, we have very much a booming waterfront. Um, downtown, South Boston, now East Boston, and Dorchester, a lot of things happening all over the city. Uh, I look out my window in the North End and there are cranes uh, everywhere. And if you spend any time at all in the Seaport, South Boston district, we've built something like 14, 15 million square feet of office space in the last three years and another 15 million feet are coming. For the first time in about 20 years, 
I have seen a, there is a church under construction. Can you see it right here in South Boston? They're moving one of the older Catholic churches. I swear to God, the purpose of this church is to pray that we'll never have the flood, uh, and that will become clear uh, in a few minutes. Um, Boston faces some special vulnerabilities, uh, even though it's reasonably well protected. Um, the sea has already risen about a foot over the last 80 to 90 years, partly because the city has subsided because it was built on fill, but also because as water warms, uh, it expands. So if you heat up the oceans, as we have done, the water expands and it rises. And if you melt glaciers and melt the ice caps in the Greenland and, Ar and Antarctica, uh, more of that, all that water goes into the oceans and it begins to rise. Um, we're in a, in a sort of main trajectory for uh, lots of hurricanes, but very fortunately because we're so well protected and because hurricanes spin counterclockwise, uh, we've had a lot of near misses. And Boston has escaped many, many times major damage from hurricanes, partly also because we have a very uh, significant tidal cycle. You know, every day the tide goes up and down somewhere between 9 and 11, 12 feet. And if the hurricane comes through at low tide, we are spared as is what happened when Sandy hit New York. That was a low tide here. We do have nor'easters, though, which is potentially a bigger problem, um, partly because they usually last longer. A big nor'easter can linger over Boston one, two, sometimes three days, and therefore go through very, uh, you know, a large number of tidal cycles during that period and can hit us at high tide. So in some ways, nor'easters are a bigger um, problem. Major challenge, and I'm going to come back in more detail on uh, some of these major challenges for the future are sea level rise. If you walk along the harbor, particularly around the aquarium or harbor towers or in the north end, and even now out into south Boston, you'll find we have about a foot, sometimes maybe two feet of freeboard, you know, the distance between the highest high tide and the land. So we don't have a lot of slack. Uh, we don't have a lot of margin of error, you know, going forward in the future. Um, Heat is going to be another issue here in Boston, less so in the, on the waterfront where you get the coastal breezes, but in the interior parts of the city. Uh, and that could be very much of a problem for uh, some of the more disadvantaged populations uh, in the city, and I'll come back to that. And then the third issue is more intense uh, precipitation. If you've noticed, the puddles are deeper in Boston. Uh, your shoes are wearing out more rapidly. You buy more and more umbrellas. We now get 21% more water in precipitation in Boston than we did 50 years ago. Uh, so we're already seeing quite a lot of change. And I'm not going to go into that topic, but it's another, another challenge for the, for the future. All of this, of course, is happening in a city where we have a lot of difficulty with our infrastructure, uh, whether it's the water and sewer system, whether it's some of the barriers and structures that are already in place to protect the city and environments, or as we're all very familiar with the unfortunate state of the MBTA, uh, which, you know, not even thinking about uh, what we might have to do to make it more resilient to the kinds of things we're going to talk about tonight, uh, but already needs six or seven billion dollars to get it in, in good working order. The good news, and I want to give you one piece of good news before I go into this slide that I want you to remember through the rest of this talk. Listen to this really carefully. 60 to 70 percent of the GNP of the entire country of the Netherlands is produced below sea level. 60 percent of the population in the Netherlands lives below sea level and has done so for about 800 years. So just sort of keep that in mind, okay? <laughs> As, as a hopeful uh, piece. So um, the other good news is that there is a lot of work already being done on, being done on this subject in the city of Boston, uh, in some ways far ahead of other cities in the United States. Many of the public agencies who uh, manage our infrastructure, whether it's highways or transit or sewers or water systems or communications infrastructure, have already started to focus on this issue and been doing vulnerability assessments to look at, to examine what the risks to their infrastructure are. Um, so in some ways, you know, we've got a good head start on that, which is very good. Uh, there have been a number of design competitions in the last two or three years starting to look at how to face this challenge and, you know, what might we have to do differently going forward. 
I see David Arnold is here. He lives in the building behind me on the screen, which is the Prince Building over in the north end, uh, which was one of the architectural guinea pigs for uh, uh, an interesting uh, design competition to see how you might redesign that building to withstand floods uh, in the future. Um, another one is in South Boston. Uh, the particular structure in the upper left happens to be on the site where GE is going to locate their new world headquarters. Uh, and this was an idea for figuring out a way to make that part of town more resilient. Um, but uh, as we began to look at this and trying to figure out how to organize this very large study that's now underway, we realized, first of all, there was a need to update the projections of exactly or try to be a little bit more precise about what is actually going to happen to Boston as our climate changes. There's a lot of anecdotes, worst case this, best case that, over the last several years. There were a lot of maps that were done to kind of illustrate different scenarios, but we thought there was a real need to put a really good scientific team together to analyze my, more carefully, particularly now that the science has improved quite dramatically in the, the last few years, uh, to try to figure out what's, gonna, what's really gonna happen. So I'll come back to a piece of that. Then you have all these agencies who have done all these vulnerability assessments, but we thought there was a real need to kind of pull those all together, get them on one map, you know, paint a clearer picture of where the problems might be, and particularly begin to look at how could we solve several problems you know, with one stone or one expenditure or one capital project rather than looking at everything piecemeal. Uh, we want to identify the high-risk areas through the city more on a neighborhood or sort of regional scale rather than the design competitions which focused on individual buildings. One of the criticisms of those design competitions was that you could protect a building against flooding, but if it's all flooded all around it, it becomes an island that you can't get to, so what's the point? So we need to look at a, at a bigger scale. Um, and then we really want to focus on developing solutions um, because this is a problem, you know, we, we've got this part of the city's biggest and most valuable tax base is along the waterfront. Um, and it creates a lot of jobs. It's really important to the economy here in Boston. We really don't want to pick it up and move it west. Uh, so we need to focus on solutions and see what we can do about this really challenging problem. So we, the Green Ribbon Commission, in partnership with the city, has put this project together. It has four phases. Uh, the first is to get clearer about the climate impacts coming in the decades ahead. The second is to synthesize all the vulnerability assessments. The third is to come up with some solution strategies for each of the major neighborhoods that will be affected in Boston. And then the fourth is to pull that all together in a final report and kind of a roadmap for uh, the years ahead. And then there will be a second phase to this project which will go into some of those areas in more detail. Uh, we've put a really interesting team together led by the City of Boston in partnership with the Green Ribbon Commission UMass Boston is coordinating all the scientific work around the climate projections. HNR, HRNA, which is a planning and economic firm in New York, did a lot of work post-Sandy in New York. They're kind of running uh, the consultant team. And then we brought in Arcadis, which is a Dutch engineering firm. They know how to put their finger in the dike with lots of experience in, uh, in the Netherlands, which we thought would be very useful. And then Sasaki is a planning and architecture firm from Watertown, more of a local uh, firm. So we have a really great team. There are three different advisory groups working on this. A large group of uh, about 40 scientists that helped with the climate projections. There's an infrastructure advisory group of all of the agencies who work on this problem, who for the first time are in the same room uh, talking about this problem. And then there's a community engagement or advisory group as well. So um, I'm going to get to the prettier pictures in a minute, but that, I want to just sort of understand how this whole thing is coming together. When we organized this lecture about six months ago, I thought we were going to be at the end of the vulnerability assessment, but it's taken a little bit longer and a little more complicated, so we're kind of in the middle of that vulnerability assessment. So I'm actually going to show you a few tables that don't have any data in them yet, but I want to give you the picture of, of what we're trying to do. So let's start uh, quickly with the science piece. Um, this is being led, as I mentioned, by UMass Boston with the, what we call the Boston Research Advisory Group, which includes scientists from MIT, Tufts, Harvard, BU, UMass Amherst, um, and several other schools, some of them outside of our region. Um, I assume here everybody has learned about climate through some or another education program here at the New England Aquarium. I assume everybody could turn to their neighbor and explain it to them. But uh, you know, just in case you can't, uh, our problem is creating this layer of gases in the atmosphere. 
uh, of which carbon dioxide is the principal constituent, which is caused by the burning of fossil fuels, whether it's in automobiles or power plants or energy that's used to heat and cool or electrify buildings. Um, that creates this blanket of carbon dioxide gases in the atmosphere. And then depending on how serious the world decides to get post Paris, we might mitigate and eliminate a lot of that carbon over time, or we might only moderately do that, or we might fail miserably and continue on the trajectory that we're coming on, that we're currently on, which would release a lot of carbon uh, into the atmosphere. So what the challenge there is that sort of forecasting how the climate might change depends on what we do about those emissions trajectory. So when you see a lot of uncertainty, it's not necessarily because the science isn't unclear, but some of the ranges are because we don't know how successful we're going to be in cutting the carbon emissions to the atmosphere. Does that make sense? Because you'll see how, see how that comes back. Um, and then, you know, how does that play out in Boston in, in terms of more heat, in terms of increased precipitation, in terms of greater amounts of sea level rise in Boston Harbor? I'm mostly going to focus on the latter, primarily because the first two aren't as advanced yet in terms of the work that we're, we're doing. But a little bit look at how our climate might change in terms of summer temperatures. Um, we're, get, we're basically going to be like Virginia or Washington, D.C., uh, if not even a little warmer than that by the end of the century. Some people might like that a lot. Um, the first frost already comes seven to 10 days later in the fall. And the last frost, maybe not this year, um, comes seven to 10 days earlier in the spring. So we're already seeing a lot of change. Our winters, with the exception of last year, are uh, more mild. Um, but the really important thing to understand is heat stress and how that might affect elderly people in Boston children in Boston, people with asthma or other kind of medical problems. Um, so the public health officials tend to really want to look at number of days over 90, number of days over 95, number of days over 100. And as you can see, there's quite a broad range in what might happen there. Um, but we're definitely going to see some change. And then what I'm going to focus uh, mostly on, we looked at three different trajectories of, of uh, climate of carbon emissions. And you might just think of this as the 2.6 is very serious cuts in carbon emissions. The 4.5 is moderately successful in cutting carbon. And the 8.5 is not very successful at all, continuing on the trajectory that we're now on. And you can see that leads you to a very broad range of predictions of uh, how much the sea will rise by the end of this century. This is the most complicated and the most important table in this report that will be coming out. It's actually going to be finished just next week or the week after. Um, and I'm not going to dare try to go in to explain it in detail. It's a four-dimensional matrix that we're trying to show in, on one piece of paper and need some good graphics to explain it. The, there are two important or three important things here. There's so much inertia in the ocean now because it's already warmed and because we're now seeing an acceleration of the melting of Greenland, Antarctica. Um, that there's a certain amount of sea level rise that is now inevitable over, say, the next 20 to 30 years. Um, so by, uh, you know, by 2050, we are now quite likely to see the harbor rise somewhere between 8 and 18 inches. Um, and if you remember what I said earlier, if you walk along the harbor, we've got about a foot, foot and a half, maybe two feet in many places. You can begin to see that we're going to have a very serious problem. Uh, beyond 2050, the ultimate sea level rise depends on very much on what we do to mitigate those carbon emissions. Um, the worst case, it could be as much as seven and a half feet by the end of this century, which would really be, you know, that would be, that would fill this well right here quite easily because I know that the entrance to the IMAX theater is within just a couple of feet of the, of the level of the harbor. So you can might think about that. Bubbles would be coming out of my mouth uh, as, as, as we speak here. Um, another way to sort of look at this is by about 2060 or 2070, there's a better than 50% chance that we'll at least have two feet of sea level rise. And those, these numbers, and it's, I'm sorry, it is hard to understand this, table. this is much more precise than anything that we've seen in the last several years. Uh, and part of the reason for that is we now understand some large uh, physical, oceanographic, and chemical processes that just five years ago we didn't understand. The most important one, and just think about how profound and dramatic this is, 
There's now so much ice melting off of Greenland and off of Antarctica that we are changing the mass of those two continents in a way that their gravitational attraction is decreasing. So heretofore, those big land masses have pulled water towards them. Uh, as the ice falls off and melts into the sea, not only does it raise the level of the sea with all that water, but it, the gravitational attraction weakens around those two big land masses. So you would think, okay, if Greenland is less effective in pulling water north, that would be good for Boston. Um, however, Antarctica is the, the gravitational attraction there is also weakening. It used to pour, pour water south, pull water south, and that water is now going north. And because Antarctica is much bigger than Greenland, we kind of lose out. More water is going to go north than it is south, which is one of the reasons that the northeast is going to feel more pronounced sea level rise than most of the rest of the world. There are other reasons to deal with the Gulf Stream and other factors. but So when you see global averages of sea level rise of x to y feet, just think about we're probably going to experience more of that here. And if you take that and couple, couple it with uh, the storm situation or the storm regime here in Boston, which is actually there is no evidence yet to, to uh, determine whether or not we're going to have more hurricanes or more or stronger hurricanes or whether we're going to have more nor'easters or stronger nor'easters. We just don't know that yet, and I'll come back to that. Yeah, quick question. Can you just tell me what RCP stands for? It's in every table. <laughs> uh, I can tell you what the 2.6 and the 4.5 and the, and the 8.8, .8, that's watts per square meter of, of heating. RCP. I'm trying to remember. That's why I hesitated for a second. <laughs> so anybody here can help me on that? It'll come to me before we finish, but uh, sorry about that. It's a, it's a standard term used in all the IPCC government reports and, and so on. But, um, but what it measures is watts per, per square meter, the amount of heating from those gases uh, in the atmosphere. So it's the same actual number? So that's the actual number of watts per square meter? RCP just stands for uh, amount of emissions. Just think of it that way. I can't remember what the, what the terminology uh, is. This chart is also really complicated. But the point is, even if the storm regime doesn't change, even if the hurricanes don't get more intense or more frequent, and even if the same thing happens in nor'easter, if the seas rise, the kind of levels I talked about earlier, the kind of storm that now has a 1% chance of occurring in Boston could soon have a 10% chance of occurring, soon after that have a 20 to 30% chance of occurring, and by the end of this century be something that might occur at high tide several times a month, several times a week, or even almost daily. That is a very, city, very different city than what we know of today. Just remember, two-thirds of the GNP in the Netherlands is produced below <laughs> the level of the sea. Uh, the other impacts, and I'm going to get to the maps in a second, which tell a much better story than these charts. Uh, the other impacts we're looking at is precipitation. As I mentioned, we're already getting more intense rainfall. Uh, that raises a real challenge for drainage. Think of every gutter in the city, every downspout, uh, all those puddles you walk in around the city, where's that water going to go? And where's it going to go, particularly if the harbor's higher and it can't flow downhill anymore? Big problem. Um, we're, we will integrate the freshwater flooding problem with the saltwater flooding problem and use that to identify the critical or vulnerable areas in the city. And then, as I mentioned, we're also looking at the storm frequency and intensity, but our scientist group has concluded for the moment, based on what we know, uh, we can't forecast any change uh, in that. So what are we going to do with all this uh, information? Um, we've divided the city up into these focus areas. I don't know uh, how well any of you know Boston Harbor, but uh, this is the main harbor right here. The main shipping channel goes out this way. This is Deer Island, where the treatment plant is. Long Island, uh, where there used to be a bridge across here, where there no longer is a bridge. Charlestown is here, East Boston here, Logan Airport there, uh, South Boston here. So we'll come back to these charts. Um, so what does it look like if we add nine inches of sea level rise, say between now and 2040, 2050 in that range, and we have the same kind of flood we have 
uh, previously a 100-year flood, which is the same flood that has a 1% chance of occurring in any year. This is the amount of flooding that you would see in downtown Boston. The storm of record is the blizzard of 1978. That was the last 1% storm to hit Boston pretty hard uh, in February. So then add three feet of sea level rise. Houston, we have a problem. Uh, if you can look at Boston uh, in this particular map, a great deal of the city would be flooded in a storm uh, that, you know, of that magnitude if, this, if the harbor were three feet higher than it is today. So what we're doing, I don't know if you can read the, uh, the code or the index on the side of this map, but there are about 20 different assets, infrastructure, buildings, even homes, uh, fire stations, police stations, hospitals, um, every important sort of thing you can imagine in the city that we are mapping and putting on these maps that show these flood risks so we can determine what really will be vulnerable over time. And then we will paint different scenarios, different amounts of sea level rise to try to, to determine where the biggest risks are. Does that make sense? So this is um, uh, downtown Boston. And then if you remember the chart I showed earlier on of what we looked like 40 years ago, um, you can see, uh, I don't know if this point will do it, the red here, which is Beacon Hill, and the hook is the north end where I live. See the hook? And Beacon Hill. Um, so back to the future, big question mark. Um, all of those white buildings are historic houses or structures or uh, buildings that could qualify for such, and you can see them you know, very much clustered in Beacon Hill, the North End, and, and Back Bay uh, for obvious reasons. This is East Boston, uh, across the harbor from us, where there has not yet been the kind of development that we now see in South Boston, um, a very vulnerable neighborhood. Um, this is what they call the Greenway right here, which is a new um, green park, somewhat like the Greenway on our side of the city over here. Uh, unfortunately, there is a low spot right here uh, where, it, where it meets the harbor that can let a lot of water in and flooding. Uh, again, this is what it would look like with three feet of sea level rise. And then South Boston, the seaport area where uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we've had something like 10 or 15 million square feet of developed of, of office and, and uh, uh, residential buildings developed in just the last three years and where another 10 to 15 million square feet is gonna be developed in the next couple of years is really right uh, in the center of, of one of the most vulnerable areas in the city. But the real problem is if the harbor raises two or three feet, and then you can see the entire area becomes quite vulnerable. Um, and with all of that development uh, taking place, um, it's pretty hard for me to see really any solution for this area we can come back to it and talk about it other than some kind of structure or barrier around at least some parts of it uh, to try to keep the water out many decades from now. Um, does anybody know where GE is going to locate on this map? Right there. If you can see it uh, right in the Four Point Channel. Yeah, this land is all owned by Gillette, uh, and there's two buildings that they've bought, and uh, I guess they're going to lease from the BRA, and then their facility will be here. GE being the green company it is, um, I think there's an opportunity for them to do something really creative and visionary here perhaps set an example for uh, what the rest of the Boston waterfront could be doing. Um, presumably, their lawyers have checked the maps and, uh, and know where they're going to locate. So there was a question somewhere back there. Yeah? I'm wondering if, uh, if these types, types of maps have been used uh, or developed for Cambridge. Yes. Cambridge did a big vulnerability study somewhat like this, and we're actually working very closely with them to sort of look at this together regionally. Um, the Charles River and the Mystic are a whole different set of flooding problems from what I'm talking about uh, today. And then finally, does anybody remember where the Olympics were going to be? Um, uh, this is the, the three-foot map of White at Circle, uh, which is right down in here. Um, the good news is I think the city was very much aware of the vulnerability there, and we're going to use that opportunity to make the Olympics an example of how to you know, build resilient structures uh, going forward in the future. So 
Just another quick look at this problem of heat stress. You remember those graphs of it getting very much warmer. We'll have more days over 90, 95, and even 100. So what we're mapping here is our, you know, where are the hot spots currently in the city um, and who might be vulnerable to heat stress going forward in the future. So this is a very different map from what I showed earlier. Obviously, it's away from the ocean, so it's warmer. Um, and each of those black dots, I think, represent 180 people. So you can see where they cluster, whether they're children, whether they're older adults, people like me, over 65, um, or other people who have medical problems or disabilities or low income or might have trouble getting to a shelter or you know, whatever. So this will be another focal point for the solutions roadmap uh, we want to develop. So that's kind of where we are. Um, from here, we're going to complete what we call these asset inventories of those 20 different kinds of categories of things that could be affected by the changing climate. We are actually going to quantify the economic value of each and every building in these zones. You can do that getting census data, uh, data from the assessor's, assessor's office, other data from the BRA uh, that's quite current. Uh, so we'll be able to put a price tag on what's at risk in the city of Boston. We're also getting a lot of data on the infrastructure from the various agencies who operate our roads, sewers, water systems, uh, communication systems, et cetera. We will zero in on uh, the major areas in the city that will be most vulnerable, integrate what we call the social vulnerability, that's the heat stress, uh, and there'll be similar maps uh, resulting from flooding and then try to identify what we call critical resiliency focus areas where we need to develop solutions going forward. Uh, this is one of these tables that we haven't filled in the blanks yet, but just to give you an idea how complex this is going to be, on the left are all different kinds of residential and commercial structures, and then in the middle we will, you know, of the rest of the columns, we will look at different scenarios of sea level rise and try to quantify the economic value of what might be at risk not just in terms of the value of the property, but if there's business interruption, et cetera. And there are remarkably good modeling programs that have been used, particularly in the aftermath of hurricanes in other cities around the United States that can be used for this purpose. Um, another example here of, um, of education, housing, health and safety facilities, and so on. Uh, all of that is going to be inventoried and then put back on these maps to try to get a really clear picture of what's at risk. A really complicated uh, project. Um, and what's really unique in Boston, and I actually feel quite good about it, is we're doing this in advance of the storms. This is what usually happens after Katrina, you know, or after Sandy. We're trying to get ahead of the curve, and Boston is quite unique. San Francisco is now doing something similar. They, of course, have a lot of experience dealing with earthquakes uh, and you know, have, have uh, similar kinds of uh, Different problems, but similar ways of uh, dealing with it. Um, so the, the last phase, which will be in June and July, um, we will be looking at um, some solution strategies for each of the vulnerable areas in the city. This is something that you want to have some very key principles in mind as we go forward. First is, how can we achieve multiple benefits? You know, we don't want to just make this particular sewer line safer, or this particular highway, or this particular set of buildings, maybe we can look at doing the whole neighborhood and get a bigger bang for the buck by working on it collectively. So that's, that's a key point. Um, we want to think about what are the natural building cycles when buildings are renovated or infrastructure is upgraded? Is it every 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years? And based on that timeline, what do you need to think about in terms of what you might have to do when? And how can you build a resilient strategy in with the capital upgrades that are going to happen anyway? So think of it this way. If we're going to spend $6 billion to fix the T <coughs> over the next decade or two decades, how can we do that in a way that we also make it resilient at the same time? Which might mean putting all kinds of structures that could rise up around all the subway entrances to keep the water out, doing all kinds of things with the electrical systems that power the T to make them resilient, et cetera, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Um, there has to be a lot more um, engagement of the population as we go forward. And then you want to work in layers to come, on, come up with strategies that uh, can take a sort of layered approach. And that might look graphically, or try to explain it graphically with these four schematics. On the left, it may be that you have to build some kind of protective barrier around a whole neighborhood. That might be what we call a gray structure, which would be typical engineering and concrete. Or it might be a green structure, which mimics the way nature might 
attenuate or diminish the risk of a major storm or a flood damaging a part of the city. You want to make sure that the infrastructure inside that zone is as resilient as possible. You want to make sure certainly that any new buildings that are being built take certain measures into account, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, certainly as we build new buildings going forward in this city, now that we know a lot more, we really need to think about making them as resilient as possible so we don't exacerbate uh, the risks that we already have. Um, and then there's a whole educational component to build awareness around these issues. Um, and I think one of the most interesting challenges here, most of the agencies, because it's their responsibility to think this way, will think about how do we prepare for the next storm, how do we make sure we get through it in okay shape, and how do we make sure we recover as quickly as we can. And I think that's the way a lot of people engage this problem because they think about Katrina or Sandy or whatever. But we may have a very, very different problem where the seas are rising a couple inches or several inches every decade. And at some point, we look out our window at the waterfront and the high tide every day is flooding. That's a very different problem than the typical sort of prepare for the next storm. We're going to deal with that with a whole different set of maps in this project to kind of see what sort of picture um, that paints. And then I'm pretty much near the end uh, here. So again, you know, looking at, le at different layers of solution strategies from you know, protecting a whole neighborhood to making sure the infrastructure within that neighborhood is resilient, make sure any new buildings are built properly and put programs in place so that we can renovate old buildings and then really prepare everybody for these changes that are coming. You need capital projects to do that. You need incentives to create best practices to stimulate the private sector to do the right thing. You may need regulations at some point in a kind of different governance system than, than what we have today. You're going to need a lot of financing. That's very difficult because the money for this tends to flow in this country after a storm for recovery. New York right now has, a, I think it's a billion six dollars, and they're building a big structure around lower Manhattan that's partially green and partially gray to protect the city. The good news is we haven't had the storm, so we're not eligible for that kind of funding, so we've got to be creative and find it in other ways. And then just some, some examples. Um, the uh, picture on the left shows something called an aqua fence, which is lying now in the basement or a storeroom somewhere in Atlantic Wharf, just a couple hundred yards from here, owned by Boston Properties. They will deploy that if there is a major storm surge around, uh, you know, if threatening their new building. And I think we're going to see that a lot of other uh, owners in the South uh, Boston Seaport area will probably employ um, similar kinds of system. In my picture there of those new buildings in South Boston in the Seaport area, which is in a very vulnerable zone, many of them have, uh, in these new buildings, have designed them in a way so their critical infrastructure is on upper floors. What you don't want is your main electrical switching pattern for the whole building in the basement. Um, the aquarium actually had that and we moved it upstairs uh, just before I got here about 10 years ago. Um, it was kind of not a good idea to put that in the basement of a building with a lot of tanks where salt water leaks all the time. <laughs> uh, but that got moved up. It was rather expensive. Uh, and it now, I think, helps protect the building and the whole aquarium uh, against this kind of problem. Some of the new buildings in the South Boston have installed a four-foot four knee wall around the perimeter of their building, which will help flood-proof the building in case there is a storm surge. Some of the more creative ones are actually making their first floor ceiling height 12, 14 feet rather than 8 to 10 feet so that if they actually have to raise the level of the first floor, they'll have some space to do that. Um, partly because of the regulations and partly because of good common sense, nobody puts inhabited structures or in inhabitable units on the first floor in these kinds of areas. Anybody who's going to live there has to live upstairs. Um, so first floors are being made more flexible, uh, thinking that they may have to adapt some way in the future. This is not happening everywhere. There are a few good examples of that. Unfortunately, most of the buildings that were per permitted in the South Boston were permitted 10 or 15 years ago before we knew as much as we now do about this problem. East Boston is quite different, where a lot of the buildings over there are now just going through the permitting process. <clears throat> Excuse me. And some of the developers there are actually elevating the buildings 12 or 14 feet. That raises a whole another challenging set of questions. What if some buildings are, are built or designed at grade level 
and the guy next door or the woman next door puts it up 12 feet, how do you connect them with a harbor walk or sidewalk? How do you meet ADA requirements, et cetera? Uh, and that's gonna be an interesting challenge uh, going forward. How could we use green infrastructure? And here in East Boston, I think we have a really great opportunity if we, if we move on it fairly quickly. We could be putting great parks along the waterfront, which could act as buffers to absorb uh, storm surge, at least for the next several decades. Uh, we could have much bigger swaths of open space, which would be really great for that part of the city and for all of us if, if we could do that. Uh, that will require a very different way of thinking about uh, how we design our waterfront than what we've done previously. And then you can take a look at Miami. And Miami is, a, is in a state where you have a governor who says this is not a problem, and you have a senator who was running for president who said climate is not a problem, but you have an enlightened mayor in Miami who gets it and has experienced it. So any new streets that they build in Miami are now three feet higher. Um, if you can look at this photo, it creates an interesting problem, though. You now go down steps into your living room rather than up. Uh, and what they are doing now in these whole blocks that are created inside these elevated streets, streets, <clears throat> they install a massive pumping system so they can get the water out in the event that there is a flood. Miami is even way more vulnerable than we are here in Boston, and they're going to have you know, acute problems going forward. But they're trying some, some interesting ideas. And then there's the granddaddy solution of all, which is actually an idea that was proposed back in the late 80s to address this problem in Boston. And that would be to build a series of dikes and locks and other kinds of protective barriers out in the harbor. Um, that's Deer Island where the treatment plant is. This is Long Island, so you would put a set of locks uh, here. And then where the Long Island Bridge was, another, another set of system and locks here. Um, I actually think, and you know, I'm probably the strongest environmentalist in the room, and I've been working on these problems for 40 years, but we may get to a point where we actually have to look at something like this. Um, I think the really challenging part, and somebody has to look at the engineering, and we may at least be able to do some of this in this project. The first thing you want to be sure of is the water's just not going to run around through <coughs> Belle Isle March and Marsh, you know, through Revere and Winthrop to the north, or around through Hull and Hingham or Quincy to the south. And you know, you really got to get the topography right. One of the challenges of the Charles River Dam, for example, if you go look at that, a lot of people say, well, why don't we make it bigger? The problem is because everything around it is low and the water would just go around the dam. The second question is we spent $6 billion cleaning up the water in Boston Harbor. Do we really want to stop tidal action? And what would that do to the harbor, which has now become a huge environmental, uh, recreational, and economic amenity here in Boston? Um, commercial shipping, how would they respond to this idea, et cetera, et cetera. One of the most interesting ironies, and we were talking about this at lunch today, is that the state <clears throat> and the federal government are about to spend $300 million to make the main shipping channel, um, you can't see my pointer, right out through the outer harbor, um, make it 50 feet deep. It's about 41 now. So they're going to deepen the harbor 20 to 25 percent. What does that do to the height of the structure you might need 70 years from now to close it off? Really interesting question. Um, I'm hopeful that we never have to get to this solution, but I can pretty much guarantee you there will be a debate over it at some point. Many of the developers that we work with, I think, kind of rightly ask the question, why should I do all this to my building if, in fact, the city or the state ultimately might do something like this that would protect all of us? Well. I don't know that we want to wait to find out the answer to that question. That's the short answer. There's a lot of things we could do to make our buildings more resilient, you know, to protect them in the near term, particularly because we don't yet know whether that worst case is, is really going to happen. Um, the other thing to really think about is we kind of bound all the studies that are done or limit them by thinking ahead to 2100. What happens after 2100 is another really big question um, if we really don't turn this big climate problem around. Um, so then just thinking about the future, and I promise this is my last slide, um, what sort of governance changes might we need to address this problem? You know, is the current regulatory system adequate or not? Um, is there enough coordination amongst the various public agencies that address this problem to really address it in the kind of way we need to going forward? As I mentioned earlier, how are we going to finance these solutions? What are the kinds of ecological impacts that might result from any number of different measures? 
what sort of political commitment is needed. If you're the mayor now, and we're fortunate to have a mayor who wants to, who supports this study and has actually helped leading it, but what benefit does he have if there's a big storm 40 years from now and the city is well protected? Is anybody gonna remember that it was Mayor Walsh you know, that was wise enough 40 years ago to do that? So it's a political challenge. And many of the developers and the property owners are planning to sell their buildings in three to five years. And this is not something that they really wanna hear about. Um, I think we're fortunate to have a number of really enlightened developers and real estate people in the city who hold onto their properties for a long time and have a long time horizon. Many of them, like Boston Properties or Beacon Capital, also owned properties in the lower end of Manhattan and experienced what a storm like Sandy can do. So they tend to have a longer uh, time horizon. But that commitment to act is a, is a really challenging thing. The public hasn't really been engaged very much in this project yet, but as we get to the solution strategies, and then there's going to be a phase two, we're going to look very much in more detail. There has to be a great deal of public engagement through workshops, awareness building, et cetera, to particularly talk about uh, solutions. Last slide, you can go to the website, which was just came on board last week, where all of this information will be mounted over the next several weeks, um, climateready.boston.gov. Thanks very much. And just remember, 65% of the GNP of the Netherlands is produced <laughs> below sea level. So I guess we have time for questions. Cool. I was hoping to confirm or not confirm something you said earlier, uh, that it's almost no chance that in 2050 that we won't see at least nine inches of sea level. Yeah. Right, or sea level right. Right. That, that's a gift. that's. Yeah, that's yeah, I think what I said, I think what the chart shows is that, there, and again, thinking about these emissions trajectory and you know, some uncertainty in the science, there's a, like, there's a pretty good likelihood, probably better than 50%, maybe as much as two out of three chance, that we'll see eight to 18 inches by 2015, 2050. So I think the eight inches is pretty much of a, <coughs> uh, a pretty certain thing. Uh, that's right, and uh, the scientists working on our project think that we're going to start to see, you know, I showed a chart early on of the sea level rise over the last 80 or 90 years in the Boston Harbor. Um, I think we're going to start to see that head up um, more sharply just in the next few years. Thank you. The, for those of you who, who are familiar with any of the aquariums, you know, fisheries or whale or agriculture, agriculture, aquaculture problems in the Gulf of Maine, you may know the Gulf of Maine was four degrees warmer than normal uh, last summer. So there's a big change that we're now seeing right here in the Gulf of Maine. Related to that sea level rise, I'm curious whether the, the projections are based on the IPCC reports or the current reports that came out in March. That yeah, I think um, those are the big global circulation models, they're called. And you know those were extrapolated down. But what we've built into this is a lot more local science and a lot more local modeling um, to represent uh, what's going to happen in our area more specifically. So, and the problem with the IPCC work is it's three or four or five years out of date. Uh, you, know, you put 2,500 2, scientists together and assemble all the papers and edit it and so on and so forth. It takes a good deal of time. So this work represents much more recent science. Um, and the gentleman on our, the scientist on our team from UMass Amherst who has led the sea level work is the scientist you've been reading about in the New York Times over the last couple of months who have put all the new studies out. So we're, we're quite contemporary. It may be crazy, but is, you know, obviously there are people working on reducing the impacts of climate change. Is there any work that you're aware of um, aimed at reversing climate change, like actually making it better as opposed to slowing the... Uh, is there a big vacuum that can suck carbon out of the atmosphere? Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a lot of work going on in the Boston globally and, you know, across the country to reduce emissions to try to tamp it down. I think you're asking a different question. Exactly. Can we actually reverse it? Yes, I think people are looking at that. The term is geoengineering. Um, I think it's, it's still quite primitive at this point, and the scale that would be needed is just so immense. You start to think about the large energy, that w energy requirements for doing something like that. What might be the adverse effects? You know, one idea is that you sprinkle particles in the clouds in the lower atmosphere, which might reflect some of the heat. 
um, what other problem might that cause? So that tends to be pretty complex, but certainly, <coughs> excuse me, a fair amount of people are looking at such. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, in the next 50 years, is there a sense that Gulf may need to give back some of its land to the, to the sea, or the costs are not going to be overwhelming and we should be able to deal with it? Is there any kind of sense? I don't think we know the answer to that yet. You know, the Dutch are really interesting. Um, you know, the first reaction here is to retreat or abandon land or try to make the buildings more resilient. The Dutch have a, have a whole different way to think about that built up over 800 years. They think about, well, maybe there's new development that we should put right in harm's way and do it in a way that it would protect itself and also protect everything behind it. Not just a barrier, but even a little mini city. And I'm actually leading a trip. We're taking 25 government officials and business leaders to uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, uh, Copenhagen, and Malmo in Sweden in, in mid-June to look ex precisely at these kinds of things. How do you create economic value that also can increase the resilience of the city? It's very different than thinking about just pack up and move. Um, so I think there's a whole you know, spectrum of solutions that we're going to have to look at. <clears throat> I've seen other ideas of building artificial islands around the harbor, even off the end of the aquarium here that you know, could provide great new park space, could protect what's behind them, and you know, maybe diminish the possibility of damage, et cetera. It's been sacrosanct, uh, and I'm one of the biggest proponents of don't ever fill Boston Harbor any more than it already is. Maybe we have to rethink that going forward. Also, I'd just like to have you keep in mind that you know, the barrier, barrier reef that we now protect, harbor, uh, protect Boston with, that could be that new city that you're talking about. That, uh, right. One of, the, one of the other keys, and I, we, we're not really looking at the Harbor Islands because the city's boundary, unfortunately, ends before you get out to, really out to the islands. But the islands are one of our principal lines of defense, and many of the islands are eroding. So one of the obvious things to do is to replenish the sand and, you know, the, and even some of the gravel that's being eroded from those islands so they can provide a better defense for the city. That might be a use of that $300 million dredging project to put that sand in places on the island where it would help protect Boston. To what extent and in what ways are you going back and forth with that Southeast Florida Climate Compact in those, those areas that are already seeing what we won't see for a while yet? You know, daily flooding at high tide. Uh, unfortunately, just this morning, uh, I was supposed to have a two-hour meeting with the resiliency officer from Miami, uh, who are going to start that conversation. She unfortunately had to leave last night, so we didn't get to meet this morning. But there is a, an active conversation among some of these cities. Uh, there are a number of groups. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, has funded what they call a chief resiliency officer now in 40 cities around the world, including Boston. Um, Dr. Martin here in Boston, who started about six months ago, works for the mayor and city hall, is very much focused on this problem. And they have a lot of dialogue back and forth amongst their colleagues in other cities. At one time, I was reading this worry about the Gulf Stream stopping its flow of warm water up this way. Is that something that you take into account? The sea level rise folks working on this project very much took that into account. And I'm not an oceanographer, so I'm not, if I can't even remember RCP, I'm not going to try to explain the Gulf Stream to you. But apparently, it is, uh, its pattern is changing. As water rises, I would expect it to affect the Neponset, Charles, and Mystic Rivers. Uh, is there work going on to look at kind of how far these storm surges would go up those rivers? There is. Uh, there's something that Mayor Walsh helped start called the Metro Mayors Coalition, which has, I think it's uh, 15 cities and towns, uh, you know, adjacent to Boston that are now working together on this problem. They're going to make use of this big study because a lot of what we've done is completely applicable to those areas because they're, they're quite close by. I was curious, when you got to the slide about the barrier around the mm -hmm. islands. Mm -hmm. It struck me that there was something sort of comfortable about that because historically it seems like that would be something that the Army Corps of Engineers would do. And I'm just curious as you're kind of wading through all of this, what to you seems like the biggest challenge uh, or what seems like, a, like a, a fundamental shift that might have to happen? You mentioned government. Yeah. Um, I, I think the biggest shift that has to start happening is we have to start thinking of these different neighborhoods as districts, as, as 
you know, and in some cities around the world, they now have eco districts where everything in that part of town is really green, not just one building, but everything. And I think we have to adopt that thinking here, whether it's South Boston or downtown where we are here or East Boston or Charlestown. Uh, we have to think about it as a district wide problem that needs a district wide solution. It sounds obvious, but we actually don't do things that way here in Boston. Every building is permitted in a very piecemeal way. Um, and we have to start thinking about this more broadly. The good news is the city has started this Imagine Boston 2030 project, which is the first time the city has done citywide master planning in 50 years. This project is very much locked at the hip to that effort. So all this work will inform decisions about that. So if a major priority that comes out of that 2030 planning process is we need more affordable housing, which definitely will be a major priority, you want to be sure you overlay the vulnerability maps with that so you determine where you might build that housing or where you shouldn't, or if you are going to build it, how to make it as resilient as possible. So hopefully those will, will come together in a, in a good way. What are the short-term and long-term considerations for the airport? Good question. Uh, actually, Massport is probably one of the most advanced public agencies working on this. Um, they have done a very similar mapping exercise to all of their facilities out at Massport. They've actually drawn lines on a lot of the buildings and a lot of the critical infrastructure, whether it's electrical substations or switching stations, to kind of figure out what they need to do. And they've already, I think, allocated close to $40 million to start making a lot of their facilities more resilient. The role of Logan Airport in a major flood is really quite interesting. We kind of think of it, oh, we got to keep the airport up and running for all our commercial flights, you know, to get to New York, Chicago, or whatever. The actual most important role for Logan Airport is to get the military in here if we need it for evacuation or medical purposes during a major storm or a terrorist act or any kind of major emergency. So they have a whole plan just focused on how do you keep the airport open for those purposes, never mind how do you keep it for its sort of normal routine economic functions. Um, they also have the luxury of having their own wallet and their own purse strings. So they have funding that they can immediately deploy, which they are, to, to this problem. Thank you very much. There was one part of the expedition in Angola that was very, very difficult. It was, you know, the water was moving fast, the river was very narrow, it was very windy, everything was capsizing, it was cold and wet, and, you know, everybody, it was much harder than everyone was expect expecting. So everyone was really kind of bummed out and, and spirits were low.